Hello and welcome to our in-person audience and to our virtual audience. Good morning to those in the United States and good afternoon to our viewers in Europe. My name is Jan Fleck. I'm the Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Europe Center and it is my pleasure to welcome you all today to our conversation with our special guest, Tanishte and Minister for Foreign Affairs and Defense of Ireland, Michal Martin. Welcome back, Deputy Prime Minister. The last time we hosted you was February of last year to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement and the state of transatlantic and U.S.-Irish relations in the context of the war in Ukraine. You're in Washington, D.C. this time to mark 100 years of strong diplomatic ties between Ireland and the United States. This year, the transatlantic relationship also continues to face key geopolitical challenges. Russia's illegal war in Ukraine entering its third year, a new conflict in the Middle East, and simmering U.S.-China tensions. This year is also the year of elections globally, and critically for the transatlantic relationship in both Europe and the United States. The results of these elections could shape not only the future of the transatlantic relationship, but also the future of bilateral cooperation. How transatlantic allies and partners navigate these elections and the geopolitical challenges in this critical year remains a key question. Regardless of the outcome, it is more important than ever that Europe and the United States continue to work together on shared challenges from supporting Ukraine to defending a rules-based international order. Ireland has long embodied these principles, and we look forward to today's discussion unpacking Ireland's foreign policy vision. With power sharing restored at the Stormont, <clears throat> the political impasse in Northern Ireland has ended. Today's discussion will also unpack what these positive developments in Northern Ireland mean for the Irish, uh, for Ireland, for relations with the United Kingdom, and for the European Union. Today, uh, joining us today to moderate the discussion is Ambassador Paula Dobriansky, Vice Chair of the Atlantic Council Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security, a former Under Secretary of State and a former presidential envoy to Northern Ireland. With that, welcome again over to Tanishte for his opening remarks, and we look forward to the discussion. <coughs> uh, thank you, Jorn and uh, Paula uh, and, and friends. Uh, it's good to be back at the Atlantic Council, um, and I think we're all very aware that since I last um, addressed you, it's been a very active and volatile year. Uh, uh, since we, we last met, and with war, terrible wars in Africa, uh, in Ukraine, uh, and, and the Middle East. And there are many challenges uh, which we must address, not just conflict, but the associated challenges of climate uh, change and, and hunger. It's always easier to address such challenges within agreed frameworks through dialogue and respective management and engagement. Against this backdrop, I thought that I might start um, with some good news. Last Saturday, the members of the Northern Ireland Assembly, the elected representatives of the people of Northern Ireland, came together to elect a new speaker and appoint a new executive. These simple steps, these basic democratic functions, had not been possible for two years. For two years, those elected to office were not in a position to make decisions affecting everyday life in Northern Ireland. The absence of decisions showed. It impacted all aspects of public life, deteriorating health care, de deter deteriorating infrastructure, strikes, a decline of faith in institutions hard won through the negotiations that we call the peace process, a process whose headline achievement is the Good Friday Agreement. Senator George Mitchell, who chaired the talks which gave us the Good Friday Agreement, described those negotiations as 700 bad days and one good day, which changed the course of history. The generation born in 1998, the year the Good Friday Agreement was reached, are now 25. For most of the seven years since they reached the age of majority, they have not seen normal politics. They now have that possibility, and that makes this a good week. 
Politicians in Northern Ireland from across the community can now make decisions to improve life for all who live there. That makes this a good week. The possibility of the future, which George Mitchell's one good day unlocked, has been restored. I want to acknowledge the support and leadership of successive US administrations, Republican and Democrat, in creating and shaping an Ireland at peace and of possibility. From the work of Senator Mitchell in the 1990s, through to Paula's outstanding contribution as Special Envoy, and today to the work of Joe Kennedy III. The contribution of successive US presidents from both sides of the aisle has been crucial to peace on our island. President Biden's leadership and his wise and careful words during his visit to Ireland, North and South last April, made a very positive impact. As the president said to university students in Belfast, the United States of America, he said, will continue to be your partner in building the future the young people of our world deserve. The United States continues to bring hope to the future of, of Northern Ireland. US leadership matters. I want to acknowledge, too, the leadership shown by Jeffrey Donaldson in bringing his party back to the devolved institutions, the forbearance of other political parties in giving Jeffrey the time and space to negotiate with the British government and to congratulate uh, the new First and Deputy First Minister, uh, Michelle O'Neill and Emma Little Pengelly. We need them to succeed. We need politics in Northern Ireland to succeed. Because like all our societies, Northern Ireland continues to evolve. Change is best managed when politics is working properly. That Northern Ireland has its first ever nationalist first minister is a sign of change. That there is a growing middle ground that do not necessarily identify as either unionist or nationalist is a sign of change. That unionist concerns regarding post-Brexit arrangements have been addressed is a positive development. Underpinning change, underpinning the potential of politics, is the Good Friday Agreement. And that put in place a framework of fundamental protections for all in Northern Ireland. Principles of equality, parity of esteem, and respect for human rights are at the heart of the political set settlement. The core point is that all can now compete equally. And that was not always the case. Also important, is that differences can and are resolved through politics, through negotiation, and not by the gun. For too long, Northern Ireland was blighted by misgovernance and violence, whose scars and horrors impeded the creation of a society of common purpose. This tragic and self-harming pattern is not unique to the island of Ireland, but thankfully, we have moved on. As Dr. Martin Luther King observed, dehumanization is a form of violence that kills the soul. Dr. King and the civil rights movement was a source of inspiration for those working to make Northern Ireland a more equal place. The majority from all traditions continue to insist on the fundamental dignity of all human life right throughout the Troubles. In the 1993 Downing Street Declaration, the governments in London and Dublin agreed the parameters for peace in Northern Ireland. Human rights and equality for all are at the heart of the Declaration and a few years later central to the Good Friday Agreement. That agreement set in place also both a normative and a principles-based framework for these interlocking sets of relationships within Northern Ireland, on the island of Ireland and between the islands of Great Ireland and Great Britain. An insistence on rights and equality and a political framework in which governments must work to the collective benefit of the people would have been very familiar to the many Ulster Scots signatories of this country's Declaration of Independence. Those that wrote, we hold these, tr these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, would hear those th truths echo, perhaps more prosaically, in the Good Friday Agreement, in which the parties state that they are committed to partnership equality and mutual respect as the basis of relationships. The legal protection of human rights, including the incorporation into law of the European Convention of Human Rights, are in the agreement as a fundamental safeguard, necessary if Northern Ireland's new start was to succeed. 
against a backdrop where the relationship between state and citizen had broken down, the human rights provisions of the agreement were essential for trust to grow. We saw that perhaps most eloquently in the reform of policing in Northern Ireland from a force to a service. Key to that transition was building for the whole community a place in the constitutional arrangements for accountability, as the architect of that reform, Chris Patton, wrote. Putting human rights at the heart of policing helped deliver that transformation and acceptance of policing by and for everyone. 25 years on, those questions of fairness, of parity of esteem and accountability remain relevant in what remains a post-conflict society with all of the complexities and challenges that this entails. This is no surprise. Building peace, transforming societies is hard work. Probably the absent part of the Good Friday Agreement was an agreed overarching framework for dealing with the past. We have tried since to retrofit such a framework and through the various talks on this issue over many years, it was clear that any path would need to be compliant with agreed human rights norms. And this was at the heart of the legacy framework agreed by the, by the two governments, uh, the Stormont House Agreement in 2014. Against this backdrop, we were disappointed to see the British government move away from that agreement and adopt instead a legal framework that has provoked serious concerns about its compatibility with the European Convention of Human Rights. It is precisely because human rights remains at the heart of the successful process of peace and reconciliation that my government, after exhausting every other path, took the decision to instigate an interstate case at the European Court of Human Rights. The victims and survivors of the troubles deserve a framework for dealing with the legacy of the past that is compatible with human rights requirements. The legal process to test this is now underway and should be left to run its course. In the meantime, there are many other important issues on which my government and our colleagues in the British government continue to work closely together. Our relationship is too important and too multifaceted ever to be defined by a single issue. In particular, we have a duty of partnership in respect of our role as guarantors of the Good Friday Agreement to see it operate as effectively as possible across all of its strands. But if I may offer some high-level reflections from the Irish experience, experience which inform my approach to the enduring challenges of peace and war in my work as foreign minister. Process is important and can itself transform participants. Rules and institutions matter. They need to be agreed, built, nurtured and protected. If outcomes are to command confidence, then processes of reform require confidence. Human rights are essential, particularly if transitional justice and other challenges are to be navigated. Protection of human rights is at the core of stability and security. International norms help navigate local challenges. As I look out and reflect on how Ireland can best make our contribution at a time of turmoil, these ref ref reflections help chart a path. This perspective also governs our foreign and security policy. Global multilateral rules and institutions matter. I have said before that for a small, militarily non-aligned state like Ireland, the United Nations Charter and the rules-based international order is our greatest global security asset. This month, two years ago, Russia, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, made absolutely clear their disdain for the UN Charter and for a predictable, stable, rules-based system. The invasion of Ukraine has had profound implications for our national security and for the stability of the European continent. The European Union has reacted with unprecedented measures, reflecting the existential nature of this threat. Our sanctions, our military assistance, our economic support, our housing of refugees, and our action at the United Nations are unparalleled in our history as a union. All of this has been done in the closest possible cooperation with the United States. The transatlantic alliance has delivered consistently and substantively to protect the values and interests that underpin our historic bond. 
we are continuing to deliver. Just last week, the European Union agreed a new macro financial package of 50 billion euros for Ukraine, which will see our support put on, on a sustainable and predictable footing for the next four years. We are close to agreement on an annual military support package through the European Peace Facility of 5 billion euros. This is important for Ukraine, of course, but it is also a clear signal to Russia. The community of nations which respect and believe in the international multilateral system are also willing to invest in maintaining it and strengthening it. In my meetings in Congress this week, I am emphasizing that both the European Union and the United States together need to stay the course on Ukraine. Russia is relying on fatigue and attrition in European capitals and in Washington to defeat Ukraine and to collapse the European security architecture. We cannot allow this to happen. The situation in the Middle East is another testament to the need for diplomacy, multilateral institutions and respect for international law as our guiding principles. The barbaric terrorist attack by Hamas in Israel on the 7th of October was utterly appalling and depraved. It must be condemned unequivocally. But the scale of the loss of civilian lives, the displacement of 85% of the population in Gaza, and the catastrophic humanitarian conditions facing 2.3 million Palestinians is unacceptable. And my message to those involved in the conflict in the Middle East is exactly the same as the message you've just heard me state on Ukraine. The rules international based uh, order with the UN Charter at its core is the cornerstone of our collective security and must be respected. The United Nations Secretary General has made it very clear even wars have rules. International humanitarian law exists for a reason. Its overarching aim is to protect civilians and that means all civilians everywhere. Ireland has been clear in our call for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire, the immediate and unconditional release of hostages, and a massive scaling up of humanitarian aid. We see no other possible way to end this horrifying conf conflict and move towards a, a political pathway. And in the context of delivering aid at scale, it will not, that will not be possible without UNRWA. Uh, the independent investigation by the United Nations is absolutely necessary uh, in respect of those members of UNRWA uh, who uh, allegedly were involved in heinous um, uh, activities. But pulling aid from UNRWA, in my view, will ultimately be counterproductive. I'm talking to all actors on the ground uh, in, in, in both the West Bank uh, and in Gaza, all of them are very clear from many different perspectives uh, that the architecture of UNRWA is central to delivering aid at scale. As difficult as it may seem, we have to maintain uh, a longer term perspective on the Middle East. This is a critical juncture. We must do everything to avoid the prospect of the voices of extremism on all sides becoming the loudest or only voices. The voices of moderation have been drowned out for far, far too long. A two state solution, as imperfect as it is, remains the only pathway to a stable long-term stability. It is only through acknowledging and supporting the equal rights to peace, security and self-determination of the Palestinian and Israeli peoples that we can finally take decisive steps to ending this bitter and tragic conflict. When we look at the problems dominating our news today, Northern Ireland seems like a small place with small problems. But it is our place, they are our problems my government, as co-guarantor of the Good Friday Agreement, is wholly committed to ensuring its implementation and helping tackle those problems. It is also your place. You helped make the peace, and you continue to help sustain it. I thank you sincerely for your support. I'm here today filled with hope for Northern Ireland and for my island as a whole. Joe Kennedy, the US Special Envoy for Northern Ireland, has been assiduous in carrying out his responsibilities. And I met him in Dublin just last Friday. Last autumn, he brought a delegation of senior business figures to see all that Northern Ireland has to offer investors. I met them at Hillsborough Castle. They were open, interested, even excited. 
but some also highlighted a key missing ingredient. Northern Ireland had no executive, no local government. That has changed. The executive is in place, comprised of those who disagree fundamentally on many things, but who will pull in one direction to provide security and prosperity for the people of Northern Ireland. At this time of wider difficulty and trouble, let that remind us that it is good to hope and that with effort, with friends, with respect, hope delivers. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Good morning, and thank you, Tonishta, uh, for uh, those excellent remarks. And especially, it's terrific seeing you again here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, it's great to have you back here. It was indeed one year ago that we hosted you to discuss the legacy of the Good Friday Agreement. So we're just very, very delighted to welcome you again. Now, today we're going to be discussing uh, recent developments around the deal uh, and also Ireland's foreign policy priorities in an increasingly fragmented geopolitical world. And I'm looking very much forward to the discussion, but give me a moment to say a few things before we dive in. One, I would like very much to recognize Ireland's ambassador to the United States, uh, Geraldine Byrne Nason, who's here. Welcome to you, ambassador. Really great to see you again and delighted to have you here in studio. And also a few announcements. Uh, I encourage everyone to follow the discussion on X, formerly Twitter, at AC Europe. And to our in-person audience and those watching on Zoom, if you'd like to ask a question, please submit your questions to ask.ac.org. And I look forward to hearing your questions a little bit later. But Tonishta, let's uh, uh, dive in. Um, you gave a very broad uh, speech and remarks and opening. I want to go back, though, to what your priorities are for 2024. I mean, as you laid out, it's, we're in a world that's very fraught with many challenges. Say a bit more about that, because also your own responsibilities, your deputy prime minister, your foreign minister, your defense minister, um, would you like to dive a little bit deeper on some of the priorities that you have and also about your visit? You've been up on the Hill. What is your primary message to the members of Congress who you have been meeting with? Yeah, I mean, we, I'm here a year on again, and, and I've been here in between in different locations. But to simply say that uh, uh, on a number of, first of all, I took the opportunity on the Hill yesterday uh, with uh, members of Congress and senators and the Friends of Ireland uh, caucus uh, to update uh, them on the good news in terms of the restoration of the executive and the assembly in Northern Ireland. Because, of course, the Friends of Ireland caucus uh, played a very significant role in terms of protecting the edifice of the Good Friday Agreement, uh, uh, given the context of Brexit and the long shadow of Brexit over Northern Ireland. And eventually we have resolved that. But the role of President Biden and the Friends of Ireland, both sides of the aisle with members, I think was very important in laying down very clear markers early on in respect of what should happen and what shouldn't happen and that the agreement shouldn't be undermined. So I want, obviously they're interested. I want to do uh, to brief them and update them on, on, on recent developments. And also then to get a, a perspective on key issues facing us in the world, and particularly with the activity on the Hill yesterday because of the various bills uh, that are under consideration. Um, Ukraine, um, I again briefed on the progress made at the European Union in respect, in respect of the macro financial deal of 50 billion euros, and also endeavoring to get their perspective in terms of What's the story? What's the up-to-date position in the US in terms of uh, aid and support for Ukraine uh, and how, how existential the issue is for many European citizens, particularly in the Baltics um, and, and many other states, Poland and elsewhere. Um, and uh, that's really felt in Europe. And there's concern uh, that if there's any appearance of faltering, that Putin will, see, will gain momentum and will see that as an opportunity. So, uh, we had good discussions on that, and of course the Middle East um, and what's happening uh, in Gaza uh, right now. And again, we, we shared perspectives because contexts are different in every uh, country in terms of perspectives on the Middle East. Um, but there is common ground, I believe, in terms of 
And people use different language because I know the language has been itself has become weaponized. Uh, but suffice to say, we, 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 we use the term humanitarian ceasefire. Uh, from an Irish public are appalled at the levels of death and destruction uh, in Gaza and the numbers of children that are dying and, and families being destroyed. Uh, likewise, we're very clear on, on the barbaric nature of Hamas's attack on Israel and the need for Hamas to uh, lay down their arms. Um, and then to move on to what happens on the day after if we manage to get a cessation and the release of all hostages. How do we create a political pathway uh, to try and create some security, uh, stability, and to try and give people some hope uh, for, for some degree of normality to come back to their lives. Uh, so we had good discussions on all of those issues yesterday, and quite a number then did raise our, um, you know, the relationship between Europe and China Ireland and China, uh, and, and that, that featured as well. Well, you're certainly here <laughs> at a momentous time in terms of a number of just key add, developments. Just Please. to add, last evening we had a wonderful um, session with uh, USAID Administrator Samantha Power, and people may not realize we have a very strong partnership. Irish Aid and USAID have together. Mm -hmm. We work in Malawi, for example, um, in terms of nutritious, climate resilient f food systems and, and crops. Uh, we're both investing jointly um, to create capacity and to create um, a, a local private market, if you like, for small farmers, uh, small female, uh, small scale female entrepreneurs, uh, and so forth. And likewise, we we have a, we work in partnership on child wasting, uh, where Ireland committed 50 million in response to a challenge that was put by U.S. aid uh, to deal with uh, malnutrition among children across the world. Well, terrific. Thank, thank you for sharing that as well. Let me go to the announcement about the New Deal, if, if you will, um, about the goods <coughs> moving from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. Uh, as I understand it, it's going to require fewer checks and also paperwork and easing some of the trade border tensions in the Irish Sea that were created by Brexit. Can you say a few words about this? You reference it, of course, in your opening remarks. But what does the New Deal signify, especially for Ireland and the Irish Sea region in this case? Yeah, I think there are different perspectives on this. I mean, I've been very clear from the outset. Um, the, it was, most people in Northern Ireland, the vast majority, irrespective of politics, particularly in the world of commerce and business and so on, uh, understood that it was important to maintain access to the European single market of 500 million people, mm -hmm. uh, while simultaneously having, obviously, unimpeded access to, to the GB market. And essentially, that is what has been attained uh, with, with a far more streamlined trading system now than perhaps was originally uh, proposed in the protocol. Uh, there have been significant changes to the protocol, most manifested in the w Windsor Framework Agreement between the European Union and the United Kingdom government, and Ireland would have played a facilitative role there. We sensitised the EU Commission to realities on the ground in Northern Ireland, and Mara Sefcovic, the Vice President of the Commission, came to Northern Ireland, visited, met with people in industry and at the coalface. And I think the, the relationship between the UK and the EU has evolved since Brexit. It's less um, tetchy. Uh, there's greater trust there between uh, President Commissioner von der Leyen and Prime Minister Sunak. Um, and that trust was essential to, to enabling the framework agreement to emerge. Um, and um, uh, unionism still had issues around um, the, the in, in the aftermath of Windsor, um, around sort of the unfettered movement of, of goods. Uh, and that has been further advanced and clarified. I mean, I would be fair, unionism has through its advocacy, uh, succeeded in changing uh, issues that were, you know, from, from the protocol to the Windsor framework. Um, and most parties in Northern Ireland gave space and time to that, although not at all happy that there was no institutions for the guts of two years. But nobody has any issue with a streamlined system where goods are going to and fro. Obviously, there's uh, the, the single market has to be protected. The European single market has to be protected. And we believe where we are now is the optimal basis for moving forward. And what's essential now is that politics is made work. We must make politics work. Mm -hmm. And everybody who's elected has an obligation to put that as the number one priority mm -hmm. for the people you represent. Um, and what worried me was a lot of newer people got elected in addition to those who got re-elected. And they had no opportunity. 
And it's a fundamental truism, I think, that if an election happens, a general election, it should automatically follow that you have a parliament convened and a government established. And I think we need to look at reforms now between now and the next assembly elections mm -hmm. in terms of ensuring that we never have a situation again that in the aftermath of an election in Northern Ireland that you don't have an assembly formed. <coughs> to me, it's, it, it, count, it runs totally counter to basic democratic principles. <coughs> when I picked up the mantle of being the president's envoy to Northern Ireland, my first meeting actually was at Dundalk. And in this case, between you know Northern and, and Ireland, and that also, that crossing, I mean, just in terms of trade, I mean, one really got certainly the strong feel about how important trade and the flow of trade all the way around really matters. So in this case, may I say that the, the New Deal, essentially, its impact on Ireland's own trading arrangements, it sounds like you're working through that. Oh, there's no issues in terms of, no of movement of goods on the island. Okay. Um, and, uh, in, and as you say, there's <coughs> huge synergy, particularly in agriculture and food. Mm -hmm. um, goods are moving forward, different parts, different components of products mm -hmm. and ingredients and so on, particularly in dairy and beef, uh, which are strong industries. Uh, we have a single energy market on, on, on the island. Um, and uh, it's important tourism has been well marketed much better since the Good Friday Agreement, particularly for the North, I would argue, and, and that needs to continue. I want to underscore that because also I think importantly in your remarks you talked about the Good Friday Agreement and its importance. So in this case, it, you know, how does this uh, New Deal ensure the underpinnings of the Good Friday Agreement? Um, and also, well, you referenced the Windsor uh, Framework uh, Agreement between the EU and the UK, that it is indeed respected? Yeah, I think the, 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 the fundamental fact of the restoration of the institutions is the, is essen is the essence of, of protecting the agreement, because the first strand is the Northern Ireland Parliament and or Assembly and government. Um, if that's not working, then the North-South dimension and very important strand of the Good Friday Agreement isn't working either. The, the North-South Ministerial Council hasn't been held for over two years. Uh, the North-South bodies on tourism, on tr Intertrade Ireland, um, <coughs> the Waterways Ireland, they've all been stemmied or um, working less optimally because of issues around appointments of directors and the very basic operational decisions that sometimes requires the presence of the North-South Ministerial Council to uh, sanction posts and so on like that. Um, so that's, that's very important. The third strand uh, continued working in terms of the British Irish Council and in terms of the British Irish Intergovernmental Council. Uh, and that's a very important strand also underpinning the three sets of relationships, as I described earlier, that have underpinned the agreement. I want to go to uh, Stormont. <laughs> and as you mentioned, uh, the rise of the executive authority coming coming into, into place. Uh, and we all, I think, uh, those of us who had been working very closely on this, we're delighted to see this. Um, can you talk a bit about what political change there might be, if any, you know, in this case? Because we have a groundbreaking situation. The first minister, Michelle O'Neill, uh, coming in. Um, you know, are there any uh, political changes that could be expected for the region? Well, again, I think it's it, a new development. It's a new development, <laughs> and we have, I suppose, in, in, in terms of Michelle O'Neill and in Emma Little Pengelly. Uh, we have a new uh, um, sort of uh, we, we have new political representatives in terms at the helm in terms of the the office of first and deputy first minister in Northern Ireland. The key issue will be to make it work, um, and there are many. They both face many challenges. To be fair, uh, in terms of the wider economic situation, challenges in the health service in Northern Ireland, but it's critical. I think you know, the, the public in Northern Ireland are a bit sceptical and. Uh, at this stage about the potential of the institutions to work for them and to succeed. So that's the big challenge. Uh, I mean, I, I would say in fairness that during COVID-19, notwithstanding all the disagreements and, and issues around COVID, uh, the Assembly and the Executive did a lot of good work, which perhaps didn't get acknowledged. So the potential is definitely there for them to, I think, and both all, all members of the Executive uh, to put the shoulder to the wheel. But they all face a common challenge to connect with the people of Northern Ireland and to demonstrate to the people of Northern Ireland that politics can work in Northern Ireland. 
um, and um, and I just fervently hope that people will concentrate on the bread and butter now for a while uh, and not allow themselves to be taken down all sorts of roads um, uh, around the bigger constitution issues which we people are entitled to have a view on and discuss but there's a real real need uh, to focus on bread and butter to win back the confidence of the people that they represent that these institutions can deliver and that's true of all politics yes yeah. i think that's quite true quite true and during my time that was very much the case even back then yeah. um uk uh, ireland relations let's discuss that a bit how would you describe it? Where where are you now with all these? There have been quite a few developments, and you did reference uh, about uh, the European Court of Human mm -hmm. Rights, the action taken, but <clears throat> I think you also put it in context. You said this is one piece, and you explained why you know, Ireland went forward on this, but you also said, look, this is you know, a, a piece in a broader context. Say a bit more about that. Well, yeah, I mean, where, where we're coming from, first of all, the, the British-Irish relationship is multifaceted. Uh, many of our families live in the UK and vice versa. Uh, we have a common travel area. We have huge economic uh, um, interchange. I mean, it's a huge market for Ireland, and Ireland's a very significant market for the UK companies. Um, and let's be honest, Brexit cast a shadow over all of that. Uh, how, how does one? And people who kind of advocated for Brexit didn't quite work out the consequences on Northern Ireland or in many other things. So. Uh, we have we've great sporting relationships, you know, uh, in all sports. We, they take our best footballers from time to time uh, in soccer uh, and so on. But I, I just want to give a sense to people that I often look, the political tensions can be there, but actually people to people, there are huge connections. You know, I have many cousins in the UK and all of that. A bit like Ireland and America in some respects in terms of the familial ties and kinship and all of that. On the political side, Brexit... You know, we, we, we have sensed change, and I think since Prime Minister Sunak came to office, I think things have steadied down uh, in, in, in terms of the UK-EU relationship, which for Ireland is very important. I mean, we, we didn't like the United Kingdom leaving the European Union because I think there is strong alignment on many issues, uh, and, between, and between us and the UK, within the European Union, we shared many common platforms on economy and enterprise and so on. Um, on however, in terms of the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement, having been a minister in the government uh, that signed the Good Friday Agreement in, in 1999, I was always clear, and people before me had said to me, how this works is the two governments working in lockstep um, on the Good Friday Agreement, keeping each other updated, heads up, and so on like that. That has faltered to some degree in recent years, uh, and we're working to restore that. And in one area where it clearly faltered was in legacy because there had been a collective agreement, as I said, in the Stormont House Agreement between all the parties in Northern Ireland, between the UK government and the Irish government. There was an electoral commitment made by the current government when they went to the elections in Britain. But in making that electoral commitment, people are entitled to make commitments, but they then sort of unilaterally went off and created a new legacy legislative model without collective engagement with the parties in Northern Ireland or with the government um, in the Republic. And as I said earlier, human rights was an integral part of the architecture of the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, and I think that is why we ended up in this space where reluctantly we had to take an interstate case. Um, and, and that we have done, and that was clearly on the table as we were going through the negotiations on our attempted uh, discussions around the, the Legacy Act. And we, I met all the victims groups in Northern Ireland. You know, when you meet families who are still seeking answers, the idea that they can't have inquests anymore or even take civil cases, uh, to me, is a fundamental denial of, of, of rights that they're entitled to. Um, and we're open that we asked for a pause, maybe that we could collectively re-engage, because, OK, you may not be happy with the old model. Can we, can we agree a new model? Um, but but that we, we are where we are. Uh, and as I said, there are many other facets of relationship, and I think both of us have a responsibility uh, to ensure that the partnership stays strong for the benefit of all who live in Northern Ireland and for the benefit of the, the, the relationships. Because I can recall a time as a youngster when uh, tensions between Britain and Ireland were really high, uh, when antipathy was, was, was quite normal, uh, and where suspicion and mistrust and so on. Now, we've made huge progress in eliminating a lot of that. 
in, 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 in more recent times. Uh, and may I say that um, uh, former teacher John Bruton was, was a key figure in helping to transform those attitudes and, and, and that sets of relationships and he's passed away this week. So I just want to reference John's contribution to all of this and his steadfast conviction led politics in respect of peace and reconciliation. So I, in that context, I would say that the British government and the Irish government uh, need to make sure that we keep an eye on the big picture, uh, which is that if the two governments keep working hand in hand in terms of the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement, supporting the executive, supporting uh, Northern Ireland civil society, um, ec economy and political uh, system, that's the big picture and we should concentrate on that. I'm going to go to a number of the questions. There are a number of questions coming in for you. But I do want to ask you this first before we move to Ukraine. There's a question on Ukraine, and I definitely want to get that in. But U.S.-Irish relations, you know, we have a number of elections. There's the EU elections in yep. June, and there are elections in November. Uh, you're here. You have visited. You've engaged. Many Americans engaged in Ireland. Um, what are, you know, where, where do you see us at this time and where are we going? Are there issues uh, that are uppermost in your mind, uh, particularly as we go through this year of 2024? Well, first of all, I think we're, uh, overall, European Union, U.S. relationships are in, in, in a relatively strong position. I think President Biden has made, clearly made transatlantic partnership mm -hmm. an important issue. Um, and from the Irish perspective, uh, we continually uh, acknowledge and appreciate the U.S. engagement in Northern Ireland. Um, the visits last year by the President and, uh, and the genuine interest uh, the State Department and, and others and the White House have had in developments has been impactful and very helpful. And Joe Kennedy, as I said, is working hard on, on, on the economic side of, 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 of that. Um, economically, the Irish-U.S. relationship is very strong. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. And yesterday I would have spoken to about uh, 20, 25 uh, US companies that are located in, in Ireland, from the tech side, digital to pharma, biopharma, med tech. Um, it's very, very strong. And Ireland adds value to those companies in terms of their global operations and particularly their penetration of the EU market um, and, uh, on, on all fronts. And likewise, then there are many, many Irish companies creating over 100,000 jobs in the US. So it's a very very strong relationship um, uh, and trade flows, investment, and so on. Uh, and I think we have to keep nurturing that and and, and, and working on that. And you must be watching closely our elections. <laughs> we are, we always do, but uh, <laughs> we're political anorexes when it comes to U.S. elections. <laughs> and many people in Ireland have tremendous detailed knowledge of every state in America. <laughs> and uh, the last election, the coverage. It's quite phenomenal in terms of how people were drilled down into county, into the districts, and so on. And that was for political anorexia at home in Ireland. That was fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And that will, we will be very interested. But of course, we don't. And it's a matter for the U.S. people to make their choice and take their decisions in the election. Let me go to Ukraine. Uh, we have a question from Fran Burwell, who happens to be a senior fellow with the Atlantic Council. Uh, this is what she asked. She says, Ireland has long been a neutral state, but you have been quite clear on the support for Ukraine. How has the Russian invasion affected Irish views on alliances, including NATO, and also the role of the EU as a security defense provider? Yeah, well, first of all, we've never been politically neutral. Uh, as I outlined in terms of our value system and democracy and so forth, we're, we're militarily neutral in that we're not aligned, we're not members of NATO. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean that we uh, stand back and, 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 and sort of allow Russia to invade um, uh, Ukraine uh, without uh, we um, uh, supporting uh, Ukraine or, or identifying the wrong, calling out the, the fundamental illegality and immoral immorality of that uh, invasion and attack on Ukraine. Uh, so notwithstanding um, our position, um, we have, through constructive abstention, facilitated the European Peace Facility, and we've made our contribution per capita. And it's non-lethal aid Ireland finances and the rest of Europe finances military aid, just as a practical working out of, of, of that. Uh, we have taken in 100,000 Ukrainians. That's about 2% of our population, uh, Ukrainian refugees. Um, many Irish people have provided their own homes or uh, houses that they might have had two Ukrainians, and the state has housed about 70 to 80,000 Ukrainians. And we've contributed humanitarian, significant humanitarian aid 
um, to Ukraine. And we have many Irish people working with EU, EU and UN institutions in Ukraine, supporting the civilian side of capacity building, particularly in areas that have been freed from Russian um, occupation. Um, and so that level of, um, of, of support will, will continue. How is it shaped? Uh, we're increasingly conscious of our vulnerabilities in cybersecurity and in um, maritime uh, security, particularly around subsea cables. And so in that context, I, I hosted and convened um, a four-day security and foreign policy forum in Ireland last year with many, many contributors from UN, uh, from former Irish military and peacekeeping initiatives to make the Irish public more aware of what actually has been the manifestation of Irish foreign policy on, on international fora for many years and more recently. What are the new threats in terms of the ones I just mentioned and how best can we respond to those? And so what we're looking at is in a European Union context through the PESCO uh, mechanism to develop stronger collaboration gain more expertise and knowledge around systems that can help us protect vital economic assets. Um, and we're also improving our own defense capability, which is poor because we're, we're not a military nation. We, we fundamentally contribute peacekeepers to various areas of conflict. That's our strength. That's where we're better at. Um, but I think across the European Union, there's greater uh, concerns now about kind of hybrid attacks, mis misinformation, disinformation, attacks on cables. We suffered during COVID uh, a horrific attack on our health service. Cyber, it, it struck down our health service in the middle of COVID. Uh, and I think that uh, woke people up, basically, in terms of what potentially can happen if, you're, if services or utilities can be hit. So we're, we've strengthened very significantly our cybersecurity um, area. Uh, and we're, it will mean more collaboration. Uh, we have. An, um, an individually tailored program uh, with NATO under partnership, partnership for Peace around those areas of vulnerability also. Uh, we just concluded that. Uh, so there's a greater awareness of newer threats that weren't there before. Um, and, um, and that certainly is exercising the mind and the need to cooperate, uh, learn with others, uh, and work with others to deal with these threats. <coughs> we have another question from Colby Bra Badhoir. Um, it reads, if the United States passes a military-only aid appropriation for Ukraine, is Europe ready to step up and make up the difference for the lost budgetary, economic, and humanitarian support? Well, I think Europe has stepped up. I mean, we've, we've produced a 50 billion uh, macro financial now over a number of years, which gives it critically a three to, four, four years, sorry, four years um, certainty to Ukraine on its budgetary side. And likewise, on the um, European Peace Facility, you're looking at a five billion provision. That would be on, a, on an annual basis. Uh, we had challenges with Hungary, uh, but those have been overcome in terms of the macro financial. But Europe will always be reviewing its position um, and in terms of making sure and that it's there for the long haul and that we underpin uh, the Ukraine's uh, overall uh, response. And a lot of debate at the moment on reconstruction of Ukraine, for example. Um, um, and not just in the aftermath of, 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 of the, the war, whenever that would be. Exactly. The Atlantic Council has been extremely active in this space, uh, meaning looking at Ukraine and really trying to advance uh, support for Ukraine in the United States, in our Congress, and also overseas. And I can attest, Europe has uh, certainly uh, mm. uh, really put forward a substantial I mean, amount if I, if of I'm resources. Honest, Europe is very anxiously watching what's happening in Washington at the moment. Uh, I'm very concerned about it. But, um, you know, we hope through the democratic processes <laughs> are at work here, we sense that a majority of people on the Hill are very supportive of Ukraine. Uh, and clearly, it will take a bit more working out to see the manifestation of that. A few more questions. Uh, one area that many are following closely is EU defense industry. Uh, various initiatives that uh, are going to be unveiled later this month by Commission President Ur Ursula von der Leyen. Um, and embodied in this particular policy, there's a general sense that Europe is embracing further defense integration um, and capacity building at the EU level, and not just related to deliveries for Ukraine. What, what's Ireland's position on uh, defense spending and integration debates at the EU level? Putting your defense uh, 
minister had on? Yeah, but first of all, from a European Union perspective, the, the, it's very fragmented in terms of um, defense systems, weaponry, helicopter types, you name it. If you compare it to a China or to a US, it's very fragmented. And that then creates issues in terms of interoperability in various theaters. So for Ireland, for example, we, we operate in a peacekeeping context. So we're, we're with Poland now as part of a UNIFIL um, a platform in, 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 in Lebanon. And there has to be a seamless interoperability between the equipment we use, weaponry we use, and so on. So we support greater integration. Um, we work with the European Defence Agency in terms of procurement capacity, because we're beginning a journey. We had a commission on the Defence Forces published two years ago. It is looking at a very scaling up of, significant scaling up of investment in defence capability. Um, but we need support from others in terms of procurement capacity, experience and so on like that. So we welcome the idea of a more coordinated um, approach. I think, to be, to be honest, there's still a journey to travel in terms of European integration, the pace of such integration. Um, but be no doubt that the Commission is very focused on this and I think what has happened in Ukraine has clearly acted as a catalyst for um, a change in the pace of direction and an impatience with the, what some would say is a, is a, whole, uh, a very, very fragmented, you know, where each country having individual sort of procurement deals and so on like that globally, resulting in a, um, a lack of, um, of, co of, of, of cohesion and interoperability. I want to talk a bit about rule of law. You referenced it, uh, uh, international rules-based order, uh, in your, your opening remarks. And it's an area that has been very important as part of your own policies. And in fact, it's something that I think also uh, really unites us, the commitment to human rights, rule of law, multilateral institution, which underpins the values held closely by the United States and Ireland, something that we share. How do, do these values guide your own foreign policy? You know, at times there are situations that arise where it could seem that there might be a conflict of you have a certain path that you have to pursue uh, which affects and bears upon national security interests. But at the same time, you know, you want to hold firm and true to, to uh, uh, one's values uh, in this case. And especially looking at Moscow's illegal invasion of Ukraine. Uh, how is Ireland working? in fact, to reinforce these kinds of international principles, despite situations that also arise that um, put us sometimes at odds with the support for those values? Well, essentially, uh, we use the, those value, values as our touchstone in terms of analyzing a situation, a conflict, and determining our response to that conflict. Uh, and we also use it in our outreach with other countries in the global south and elsewhere in terms of their perspective, say for example on Ukraine, so we would have gone to African states and others to argue for stronger positions in respect of Ukraine. Uh, now we do it respectfully because many people in the global south are not too fond of Europeans coming saying here's how you do things, but at the same time there needs to be consistency of approach across, by, by, I would argue by states in the global south as well in, in respect of issues, so we, we must all strive to uh, use those values and, 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 and multilateral organizations as our norm. I think the Russian invasion is fundamental because it's a member of the Security Council and it undermines the credibility of the Security Council, it undermines the credibility of the UN that a, a, a member of the P5 is actually willfully breaching a core um, part of the UN Charter. Uh, and that basically should act as a catalyst for reform of the United Nations and of the Security Council and particularly the composition of the Security Council and the vetoes uh, that get deployed from time to time which are paralyzing the capacity of our premier multilateral organization to respond to, to conflict and crises all over the world. Um, so that's the first point. I think the second point I would say is that we need to always support multilateral organizations. Notwithstanding issues that people may have with them, if we continue to undermine them as happens in conflict situations. I mean, um, when we were on the Security Council, Ethiopia were not entirely impressed with the stance that Ireland took, and we took a strong stance. 
Uh, we take a strong stance in terms of humanitarian access. We take a similar position uh, in Ukraine. We took a similar position in, in, in the Middle East. Um, and we stand up for UN organizations. Um, people are surprised, but we stand up for UNRWA and Philippe Lazzarini, notwithstanding what has happened. There are 30,000 people working for UNRWA, 13,000 in Gaza. Um, when I visited the West Bank in September, um, it, you know, and, and, the, and the support we give, it's, it's providing education. It's, it's the one area of hope that I see for young Palestinians to try and escape from sort of the conflict narrative, if you like, and the conflict norms, and try and create horizons for people to engage in life and in enterprise and so on. I met young women in, 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 in um, Ramallah uh, in a school that we fund uh, and that we partner with, with, with the UN on. Uh, and these were young women, articulate, wanting to set up their own businesses. And that is the future, you know. And um, if, if the only game in town is to say, tear down an organization, how do you rebuild that? And what do you put into place? And how long does that take? And so on. So, the, so I think, and it's difficult. I look, and there are complexities, don't get me wrong. And I, I understand fully uh, that uh, there will be people who will abuse your or support or will abuse situations. That, that, but then you have to have very rigorous, and the UN, and on, they all have to have rigorous mechanisms to independently investigate and make sure that anybody who's engaged in heinous activities is dealt with, um, because that destroys the overall vision. So that, I, I think consistency as best as one can. Because, of course, the big debate, even domestically in Ireland, from the far left and others, is the water boundary debate. <laughs> it's the easiest line in any debate. You're taking a stance over there, but what about over there? Uh, uh, and so we endeavor to be consistent on the international humanitarian law question. And also, as we participate in various cases that come before international courts, to be rigorous in not politicizing the courts. Uh, and we've taken a lot of domestic criticism for that, even though we are actually before the ICJ on a case in the, in the West Bank, for example. But we do it with genuine rigorous analysis. We were involved in the Ukraine case versus Russia. But it took us five months to intervene. But we, because our legal people had to analyze it. Because if you don't treat the, the court with credibility, if you're simply going to write a letter and intervene on spurious grounds, you're undermining multilateral accountability uh, mechanisms and fora. And so I'm very strong on that. Much, sometimes people get impatient with us on that. But we say we will judge something on its merits. We're not going to rush in. Because what will undermine the courts, most of all, if it's perceived to be just uh, another fora where you, everyone piles on for political purposes and not deal, deal with things. With, uh, and I'm not saying that in context of any particular cases that have emerged in recent times. We'll analyze them all properly and decide at the appropriate time, both if we're going to intervene and the basis upon intervention. Tolishta, <coughs> we've come to the end of our interview and you've really covered uh, quite a bit of ground and really have uh, given us uh, very precise answers to questions. But I have one last 30 second question and that is, you were here a year ago, you're here now. Can we expect to see you again here at the Atlantic <laughs> Council? <laughs> so we're counting on a yes for your answer. <laughs> I'll give a yes to that, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd be delighted to have you back and just uh, thank you for coming today. Please join me in thanking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.